We'll talk about all of that over the next hour. Um, Theron, would you like to introduce yourself before we start? Hi, everybody. <clears throat> I'm Theron, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator here at the District. And I'm excited to talk to you all about different ways to reduce toxins in your home. And just a quick housekeeping note before we get started. Um, we, you're probably all familiar with Zoom by now. Um, there's a chat box and there's a Q&A box. If you could keep your questions in the Q&A box, that just helps us um, be organized and not have to look in two different places to answer them. So if there's a comment that you want everybody to see, please, by all means, put it in the chat box. But if it's a question for Theron or I, um, just put it in the Q&A box and we'll get to those. We have a couple stops during the presentation and then we'll have a Q&A session when we're done. So I'm going to um, mute so Theron can get started. All right, so <clears throat> let's start by reviewing some water systems and just to get an overview of how water comes to us, how we use it, and how it gets processed. Then we'll talk about common contaminants, some of the things that we're, that we're worried about getting in the water. We'll talk about <clears throat> proper disposal of these things. We'll talk about different ways to reduce our use of these things. And then we'll um, wrap up with some questions and answers and some resources for you all. So <clears throat> the important thing to remember when thinking about water is that it's always recycled. It starts out at the source, that might be a reservoir, might be a river, might be a lake, um, it might be a well. Then it needs to be filtered and treated. And after that, it's pumped out to homes and businesses for people to use. After that, usually it needs to be recaptured in some way and, and recycled and it does need to be filtered and treated again from whatever contaminants end up in that water during the use of it. After that process, it's then returned to the source. So um, it's important that it, that it is treated because during our use of the water, we are introducing different kinds of contaminants into it. So at the wastewater treatment plants, water is treated to remove a number of different kinds of contaminants. We're talking about microbial contaminants, inorganic contaminants, pesticides and herbicides, radioactive contaminants, and organic contaminants. So the microbial contaminants could be um, bacteria or other pathogens. Inorganic contaminants might be minerals or uh, different debris. Pesticides and herbicides obviously are ending up in the water um, oftentimes just through runoff and, um, and it's sort of a side effect of using those, those materials. Um, radioactive contaminants uh, can include things like radon. And then organic contaminants are, they might be food scraps or they might be um, human waste that goes into the water through our sewer systems. So all of these things need to be filtered out and treated for. <clears throat> So let's talk a little bit about common contaminants and go into some more detail on these. Cassandra, do you wanna jump on and, and talk to us a little bit about some of these? Thanks for the nudge. <laughs> yeah, um, and so far no questions, but as they come in, we'll take little breaks between the sections. So if folks do have questions, um, just put them in throughout and we'll stop to answer as we go and um, in between. So um, we're gonna talk about some of the things that are commonly found in households. Um, and most of these things are treated as household hazardous waste and not all of them. Some of the um, personal care products and, and by drugs, we mean pharmaceuticals, aren't necessarily treated as household hazardous waste, but they are, many of them are toxic um, in different ways. So we're gonna start with household hazardous waste because that is the most common um, type of material that everybody has some of in their household. Um, and I'm wondering if we can go to that slide now. Um, I'm just gonna wait for it to move to the slide, but I'll start talking. So household hazardous waste is the kinds of things like, um, you know, cleaners, pesticides, herbicides, 
And typically they have fairly extensive labels and there are signal words on the label. So um, I recommend if you're using, we, we're all accustomed to getting a cleaner or something and just using it. It actually um, might be worth your time to read the label, even on something you feel like you know pretty well. Um, if you see these signal words, you know you have material that is treated as household hazardous waste. Um, and so, you know, flammable, reactive, corrosive, toxic. Um, most importantly, I would say the big, not most importantly, but the big bold words are going to be danger, warning, caution. Um, particularly the words danger or warning. Those, if you see those signal words, um, you have a toxic substance, you have actually a hazardous waste. And um, so read the rest of the label. It, you'll often also see words about, you know, protective gear you might need, and you might be surprised um, by what kinds of materials you should be wearing goggles or um, rubber gloves or some other protective gear or a face mask, um, flammable. So you can see on these, and I think we can close, go a little closer in on that photo. This is a compilation of a few different just common household items. I think Theron actually took this photo fr from items he found at his house. Um, and they all have the signal words on them. So if Theron were gathering materials, if you were all done with those, these would all be gathered together to be handled as household hazardous waste. Um, and in a little while, we will talk about exactly what to do with household hazardous waste when you're done with it. Um, so, and these are examples of the kinds of things that are fall under this category of household hazardous waste. Um, and I just want to stop for a minute and clarify Household hazardous waste is a different term than hazardous waste. Um, it's hazardous waste, but it's very specific to households and it's handled differently. Um, so uh, I just want to, I know that's a sort of a technical semantics thing, but that's why we keep using that word household in there. So you can see chemical cleaners, um, bleach is a big culprit, um, bleach cleaners, automotive products, sol solvents, the poisons like pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, fuels, um, acids, all of these are under the category of household hazardous waste. And again, if you have an item and you're not sure, look at the label, look for the signal words and read the label, even if you've already used it, um, in case there's more that you should know about it. Um, and we, again, there's a proper way to dispose of these. I'm not gonna go into that this minute, but we do have a whole section about disposal at, that will where we'll go into more detail about how to handle these products if you're all done with them and you're no longer using them. Um, I did want to add one last thing um, on the household hazardous waste slide, which is if you have a, an item, sometimes this happens when people clean out like a parent's garage or an old barn or something, you might find um, items that's, that clearly are some kind of a chemical, but the label has like long ago worn off or it's no longer legible. If you have a situation like that, just assume it's household hazardous waste and treat it like that. And, and um, that would mean storing it in a cool, dry place. And then we'll talk about what to do with it when, um, when you're ready to dispose of it. Um, so cleaners. Um, here, the thing about cleaners is we know that they're treated as a household hazardous waste when you need to dispose of them. Um, but they're designed to actually wash down the drain. You clean your toilet bowl, you clean your bathtub and your sink and your counters, you wash out the sponge and it all gets flushed down the drain. And some people will actually pour the leftover cleaner down the toilet. Um, so it goes, it goes into the wastewater treatment plant, it gets treated. Um, some of those chemicals might make it through their system, but ultimately it ends up back in our drinking water by um, going into the water table and then recirculating back. Um, into what we pour out our tap. It may be in trace amounts, but um, many elements of these cleaners come right back to us and our neighbors. And that's the case whether you have a septic system or you're on a municipal water supply. So the other common um, material that, toxic material that is in most households or in many are these poisons, um, the ISIDES and the C-I-D-E-S indicates that it's something that um, it's designed to kill. So pesticides, um, herbicides, fungicides, and fertilizers also fall under that category. And although we don't expect people to be flushing these down the toilet, when you use them, they get washed into the water supply by rain, hoses, 
um, off your driveway into the road and ultimately they end up in the wastewater treatment plant. Um, so they're also treated as a household hazardous waste. Um, and there are some real adverse um, effects that can happen from using these materials. Oh, we'll talk about that a little bit and we'll talk about how to not use them or use less of them. One of the things that can happen is um, you can end up killing um, plants or or pet or insects that you didn't want to. Um, a lot of um, pesticides end up killing bees, for example, um, and or other pollinators. There's um, fertilizers have been the culprit behind, to behind toxic algae blooms. Um, you may have remember the phrase the the. Um, the toxic algae cyanobacteria there in Poppin, if I said that incorrectly. Um, but that was really in the news last year when um, it was, there was the cyanobacteria all over Lake Champlain and in different lakes and ponds throughout the state. It was a highly, highly toxic. Um, it made the water absolutely unusable for humans and it was toxic to the wildlife in the water. Um, obviously having poisons that kill animals and plants can ultimately also harm wildlife and pets. Um, even like we have here an image of decon. Decon can kill mice, but um, you know, it also goes up the food chain if something eats the mouse that has been killed with the decon. Um, so uh, they all have negative side effects. Um, okay, and I know that we're just stopping at that place. We will be actually talking about how to use less of these items and we'll be talking about what to do with them in a little bit. So personal care products. This is a section that surprises a lot of people. Um, and these, all of these um, personal care products do not fall under the category of household hazardous waste. They go in the trash if you're not going to use them. Um, but there are some really toxic, um, uh, problematic ingredients uh, in these items. And by personal care product, we're talking about anything that you put on your skin. And this is a partial list, but it's um, most of the things that we're referring to. Sunscreen, body wash, shampoo, um, perfumes. Your skin absorbs them and whatever's in that product will literally go into your body the same way it would if it got in your eyes or if you swallowed it. So um, we're gonna show you how to pay attention to the ingredients in these. Um, so the other thing that happens is it goes into your body but when you shower or swim, those materials also wash off and go into the wastewater stream. And again, as we've been repeating over and over again, not all of these products are screened out at the wastewater treatment plant. And some of them come through in trace amounts and they end up back in the water supply. Um, so these are, this is a list of the chemicals that are commonly found in personal care products. Um, this is, we're sort of clumping everything together and not going real deep into this topic, but um, my suggestion to you would be to save this list and keep it in your wallet for when you're looking for shampoo or sunscreen or um, some kind of a lotion and just look for these words. There's a lot, there's hundreds of other ingredients that end up in personal care products, but these are the ones that are like the, the most widely known culprits that cause real human health problems. Um, some of them are endocrine disruptors, which can mess with your hormone system. Some of them are known to cause reproductive harm. There are carcinogens. Um, some of them are not only disruptive to human health, but animal health and like oxybenzone and I'm not octin, <laughs> the ingredients found in sunscreens um, kill, can have really damaged coral reefs. And that's just from washing off people's bodies. Um, triclosan, that's another one I wanted to mention. Triclosan is an antibacterial, you'll see in antibacterial soaps. Um, there's a whole family of uh, chemicals that start with the word tri. For that one, I use my sort of shortcut for that is I look for an ingredient that starts with TRI. If I see that, I don't buy it um, because there's a, a triclosan is only one of many that are in that family. Um, so just if you have little shortcuts for yourself to remember what not to buy. The other item on here is microbeads and those are banned in the US. You probably remember when you used to see them in body washes and, and people thought they were great at scrubbing um, your skin, but they're actually just filled with, those are microplastics and they get into the environment, they accumulate and poison fish 
Um, so if you have any leftover microbeads, um, any con products containing microbeads, don't use it. Um, it actually needs to go in the trash, I'm sad to say. Um, I think I'm ready for the next slide. Okay, lastly, pharmaceuticals. Um, this is certainly by no means the last potentially toxic item in your home, but this is another one that can cause problems when flushed or um, safety issues if somebody is coming in, if someone in the house is um, trying out the wrong pharmaceuticals uh, for any reason. So um, by pharmaceuticals, we essentially mean anything you take in the form of a pill. So not only prescription pills, but over-the-counter medications, um, painkillers, birth control, cough and cold medicine, antibacterial steroids, all of that, um, vitamins, uh, all of that falls under the category of what we call pharmaceuticals. And um, I think pharmaceuticals may be more problematic than some of the other items we've talked about because at this time, as far as I'm, I know, there is no treatment for those in the wastewater treatment plants. Um, so any pharmaceuticals that get washed down the drain and they can get washed by somebody flushing them down the toilet or they, you know, they go through our bodies and we deposit into our toilets and they get flushed into the system. Um, and they're not really getting filtered out. So they do end up back in the water supply. Um, this is a list of the pharmaceuticals that are most frequently detected in streams. It's not the complete list, it's just the most frequently detected. And if you think about that, that'll end up back in, um, ultimately back in the groundwater and in our taps. And that's everything from steroids to insect repellents, stimulants. Um, I think one thing I don't see on here that I've, I have seen in these lists is the um, antibacterial, um, not antibacterial, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I, I missed the um, word. Anyway, this is a, this, I think if we go to the next slide, we'll see a source for this. There's a really good article um, and we're gonna send out, um, you'll get a link to this recording so you can go back and look up some of these sources if you want more information, but this has been studied pretty extensively. Um, so some of the things that happen when pharmaceuticals go into the water, they can remain in the surface water um, and they persist. They don't, they don't um, ultimately break down and go away. Um, they're in our biosolids and in treated water. So that means they've already made it through the uh, filtering treatment process. Um, you know, of course they cause human hormone imbalances and many other things because it's like sort of a soup of all the different pharmaceuticals that everybody uses. Um, and, and not only do they harm us, but again, they can harm amphibian and fish populations. Um, and just to hammer the point home, I know I've said it already, but if you're flushing drugs down the drain, um, they are recirculating back into the water supply and they're coming back to humans and wildlife. Um, and so we do have some information about how to dispose of drugs and we'll talk about that later, but um, there are some options so you can get them out of your house. Um, so, um, and here's a, here's one more slide about that. Oh, <laughs> okay. We're just popping back and forth. It's hard. We don't both, we're both presenting, but we don't both forward the slide. So we're trying to, we're trying to get um, good at anticipating when the other one's done. So lastly, let's talk about landfill leachate and then we'll take, I think we have a few questions here. Um, so landfill leachate, leachate is the liquids that pass past the landfill. And usually that happens through rainwater. It filters through everything in the landfill and then it creates this toxic, uh, you know, ooze that um, filters out. Usually there it gets captured. Um, some of it, all landfill leak, all landfills leak no matter how well lined they are. And we have some very high tech lined landfills now, but every study that's ever been done about landfills, they ultimately do leak. Um, but mostly they capture this leachate and treat it. And in case you weren't aware, it gets treated at um, municipal wastewater treatment plants. And then just like everything else that gets treated at those plants, discharged back into the water system. So um, if anyone who's logged on right now is in the Montpelier area, you might be interested to know that that leachate is actually coming to the Montpelier Wastewater Treatment Center, among others in the state. Um, and so this is, um, this is some information about a study that was done specifically about landfill leachate 
and what hap what's in it before it's treated and what's in it after it's treated. And the bottom line is all of the materials that were found pre-treated, just straight up landfill leachate, were also found after treatment, just in smaller amounts. Um, so you can see the list here, um, but a lot of that list contained pharmaceuticals. Um, you'd have to look at the whole study. It was pretty shocking. Um, but that leachate is coming into our local municipal wastewater treatment centers and getting discharged back into the water, and that includes these chemicals. Um, so the more that we can keep out of the landfill, the less of this stuff we're going to have coming back into our water supply. And here's a wonderful um, visual of landfill leachate. Um, and again, they go into the streams in the groundwater and it circulates right back into the system ultimately. All right. So Farron, we have a few questions. We do, let's answer some questions. And we can leave this lovely leachate image in the background. <laughs> All right, so Anne asks if we can send the list. Yes, we can send the list. That'll go out with the email. Um, and she also wanted to know why companies are allowed to sell these chemicals. Do you want to take that one, Cassandra? <laughs> sure, but I don't have a great answer for you. I actually, um, wow, I could go off on a real tangent soapbox about politics and big corporations and all that, but I won't do that. I will just say that um, there is a really good organization called the Environmental Working Group, and I believe their, their website is on our resources at the end. It's also, I think the, it's ewg.org, um, and they do a lot of um, work around stopping some of these chemicals from being commonly used in, um, in all, and especially in, their focus is a lot on personal care products. And so if you get into their website, um, you can get alerted when they're doing um, some specific work around, say, um, you know, they had a whole program on sunscreens a while ago, um, and you can, you can be a little more active. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of grassroots work, just like anything, um, but I don't know why companies are allowed. Um, and I would add that the best thing that, that we can do as consumers is do good research and make good choices on the products that we're buying and that we're using and do our best personally in our decisions and our purchases to avoid these kinds of toxic um, chemicals that will ultimately affect us and our environment. Absolutely. Um, the others were, she was curious about, um, somebody was, was curious about the fire retardants. Um, I'll take that one. Um, it's not the, the same kind of things that they use for putting out fires. Those fire retardants are found in furniture and mattresses and things like that. And they're designed to make those things safer so that they don't catch on fire, but they are toxic. So, so that's what we're referring to when we're talking about fire retardants. Um, and then the other one was also from Anne. She, uh, Wanted to know if bifes, bisphenol A is on receipts and why we can't have better receipts. And um, do you want to talk about this one, Cassandra? Yeah. Um, I can't answer to all receipts, but um, my understanding is because of that, for a very long time, you could not recycle receipt paper. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers that. Um, but a few years ago that changed and you can now recycle your receipt paper and I believe it's because they changed the process. Um, that's as much as I know about that. Um, I don't have a lot more information, but it is something I'd be interested in learning more about. Um, and we would, we would get that information out there when we have it. I'm sorry, I can't. Do you have any more to add to that, Taryn? No, I don't. All right, well, that's all the questions. Thanks, Anne. Um, let's continue on. The next section, I'll be talking about <clears throat> proper disposal of these things. So we'll start out with household hazardous waste. 
Then we'll talk about personal care products and we'll wrap up with drugs and pharmaceuticals. So for household hazardous waste, we as the, the waste district and all the waste districts in the state of Vermont run annual household hazardous waste collections. There is also the Chittenden Environmental Depot, which operates year round. And right now it's by appointment only. So if you go to their website, you can schedule a time to bring your hazardous waste for disposal. Uh, so we run five hazardous waste events every year currently, and we do it in, from the spring through the fall so that it's nice weather when you show up. Um, <clears throat> the important thing for these is that you store your household hazardous waste un properly until it's time for those events. If you have it um, in the off season, for example. Um, so it's pretty easy to do that. You want to keep it cool and dry out of reach of kids and pets and you want to make sure that it's not somewhere where if it floods it's going to end up in the flood water and again ultimately into the water system that will poison that. <clears throat> so you can find out more about our household hazardous waste collections on our website and we have a couple more this year and if you're in our district, you're welcome to come to our events. <clears throat> if not, you should check out your own waste district. I'm sure they have, they have um, has waste events as well. And then there's the Chittenden Environmental Depot, which anybody can use. For personal care products, uh, this is the, those things like sunblocks and lotions and um, deodorants and, and other things like that, that some of which contain some chemicals and materials that you, that you want to avoid. The best thing to do with these is you seal them tightly and you dispose of them in the trash. And moving forward, you make sure that you choose products that aren't toxic and that don't have those chemicals that we put the list out of. And, um, and really one, one of the, easiest ways or the best ways to do that is to look for third party certifications. <clears throat> there are a number of organizations that research different products and they give them their certification stamp on the package. If they deem those products to be safer or free from certain content, certain chemicals of emerging concern. <clears throat> so, these are some some logos The look for the zero is about microbeads and microplastics campaign for safe cosmetics. They research cosmetics, obviously. And then uh, EWG is the environmental working group. And they research all kinds of things, everything from cleaning products to um, personal care products to cosmetics. And they have a, a great website with a lot of information. We'll we'll link to that later and you'll be able to to look that up yourself. <clears throat> pharmaceuticals. So these are, these are medications and drugs and things that, um, things that you want to make sure that you dispose of properly. So there's a national drug take back day. Usually it's in April. This year it's been rescheduled for October. Um, you can also bring your unused medications to your local police or sheriff's department. Um, in Vermont, there are also lots of drop-off sites at, like local drugstores or hospitals. <clears throat> and then there's also a, a mail-back program. So Vermont has a very robust system for dealing with these, with these drugs that we want to keep out of the water. <clears throat> uh, if you want to learn more about the National Take Back Day, it's at the DEA website. <clears throat> this is an image of one of those mail-back envelopes. And I'm actually going to take us on a, a little field trip to the <clears throat> to the De Vermont Department of Health and we will <clears throat> look up how to get rid of our unused medications. So right here, <clears throat> there, this is the website for the, for the Vermont Department of Health, of Health Drug Take Back Program. It has some tips on how to store your unused medications. 
here's the form for the mail back envelope. That's really simple. If you click here, you just fill out the form. They will mail you one of these envelopes. You put your unused medications in it. It's prepaid postage and you mail it back to them and they will dispose of it for you. Very simple, very effective <clears throat> and very easy. Um, there's also a video on safe storage. Um, you wanna store your medications locked and out of reach of kids, obviously. Um, and then they also have on the website a very handy uh, map that you can check out your area. <clears throat> so we're here in Montpelier. If you zoom in on the map, you can see there are a number of drop-off locations right here. So there's the Montpelier Police Department, there's the medicine shop, there's the Central Vermont <clears throat> Medical Center, and any of these places will have a medication drop box where you can drop any unused medications that you may have. So, so like I said, here in Montpelier, there are a number of locations and they try to make it really easy. They have these big drop off boxes and that's what they look like. So <clears throat> it's a good way to, to get rid of them very simply. I think I would probably use the mail back envelope. Um, and, uh, and the other thing to remember is that it's, it's best to get rid of those unused medications as soon as possible. Um, there is some concern about, for example, pain medications and, and people wanting to steal them. Um, and it's also just risky to have, have those kinds of medications around um, if you have children around and, and essentially the, the, the takeaway is that you, nobody should be taking other people's drugs and if they're flush down the drain or if they are in the wrong hands, um, there's going to be some negative health effects. So, so make sure you store them properly and dispose of them properly. All right, <clears throat> Cassandra, do you want to hop on and, uh, and do we have any questions? that have come up? Um, yeah, <laughs> no, we just have a comment that we misspelled the word sheriff. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, we'll fix that, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, Cassandra, do you wanna talk to us a little bit about different ways we can reduce our use of some of these um, toxins and... Uh, All right, more? let's do it. Um, okay. This is my favorite part of this presentation because this is where you can really like look hard at what you have in your house, your own habits and, um, and some of the things you've been using that you may not have thought about um, very thoroughly yet. Um, and so there are some, we have some suggestions and ideas for how you can reduce your use of toxic materials. Um, and maybe you would, um, you know, you could even stop using some of it. And, um, and we don't expect everybody to just immediately never use like cleaning products or automotive fluids again. We just want to give you some ideas on how to reduce your use. Um, so we're going to start by talking about pest control and those poisons that we mentioned earlier, the pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, et cetera. Um, so some of the really like simple ways to um, reduce or stop using um, the poisons are um, to manage your conditions. Um, so for example, we have a nice little mouse here, um, which isn't so nice when you find it in your house. Um, so that the managing conditions might mean clearing out the weeds around your foundation and finding the little, the hole, the entry holes. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Um, in a compost system, it might be a very similar process. Um, look for where the pests are coming in. Um, you know, this doesn't, this is, we're talking about mice here. It could be, um, there's all kinds of insects that people are trying to control in their yard. Um, so start by managing your conditions. Um, what can you do to the environment to discourage the pests? Maybe that means screening over your dryer vent, or maybe it means uh, doing more weeding in the garden to get some air circulation and, um, or hand picking potato bugs. I don't know, but um, that's, one, that's one way. Um, not, there are a lot of natural pest control measures. I just learned a really good one for rodents. Um, this was actually from Charlie Nardozzi. He's the 
Ver, uh, Vermont famous garden guy who's on VPR a lot and he's written some good gardening books. He recommends just soaking some cotton balls in peppermint essential oil um, and putting that where you see their holes. Apparently they cannot stand the smell of it. Um, so that's a that's the example of a managing conditions or using a mechanical um, something that's just natural. Uh, mechanical using a mechanic mechanically excluding pests. This is a great example of mouse trap. In the case of a compost bin, it might mean installing some hardware cloth under or in around the bin. So you're using you're actually mechanically installing something that that stops the pest. Um, there are a lot of natural alternatives. One example I can think of is in the garden. There are a number of pests that, um, that for example, w will you can manage with BT. I, I can't bacillus. I can't remember how to say it, but it's an it's a natural pesticide that doesn't harm humans. Um, this is an this is an image of a compost bin with um, hardware cloth. Ooh, it's rotating. Did we mean to do that? <laughs> Darren's playing with the Prezi. Um, you can see the hardware cloth on the side there. That's called managing conditions because this is set up so that there is a uh, theoretically impenetrable um, you know, wall of hardware cloth, which is a um, stiff metal fencing that, or screen rather. Um, so those are the kinds of things we mean when before you start using poisons, what can you do to just manage the conditions? Um, so yeah, this is an example. The other examples are traps, changing irrigation practices, using mulch to control weeds instead of uh, herbicides. Um, another thing, this is a little bit more of a radical step, but some people learn to embrace their weeds and love them. Um, I eat dandelions and pigweed and some of the other purslane. Some of the common weeds you find in your yard or garden are actually edible. So that's another approach is um, to look at them as useful plants instead of weeds. Um, and then you don't need herbicides at all. Um, I think I'm ready for the next slide. Yeah, here's another great example of traps. Um, there are all kinds of just, you know, like fruit fly traps and that kind of thing that you can make your own or you can buy. Um, these, these are often more effective than poisons also, in my experience. Um, so moving on to personal care products. This is a real tricky one. Um, so this is where what Theron was talking about in the Q&A session a little while ago. Um, learning as much as you can is the first step in taking responsibility for what you're buying and what you're putting on your body. Um, so checking ingredients, just like we talked about with household hazardous wastes. Look at the label. The label, by the way, is, does very rarely lists every ingredient. They'll tell you the active ingredient or the one that is the, you know, the highest concentration, but even that gives you information. So you'll have, we're going to send you that list of the ingredients to look out for and just keep an eye out for those, um, for those um, specific. I think we're going to see that in a slide in a minute. Another option is to choose natural products with ingredients you recognize. Um, avoiding highly perfumed products. Perfumes have literally hundreds of ingredients in them and they're almost never revealed, but many of them are toxic. That's why you do hear of people who have sensitivities to scents uh, because there are toxic ingredients in many highly perfumed products. Um, using natural bristles, for example, on toothbrushes or vegetable scrubbers, um, the, because as you're, or you're just your scrubber in your sink, as you're scrubbing, those actually create microplastics that um, go into the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, wait, yep, here's a great sample of it. I want to go back to that. Um, can you go back to that image of the, yeah. So these are third party certifications. Theron mentioned them earlier. And the reason why we're repeating them is because um, this is a really good shortcut for um, if you want to make sure you're getting something that's been vetted and has safe ingredients. If you see a, one of these third party certifications, these are the ones we know of and we, um, we believe are um, valid. There are many others out there that we haven't yet looked through. So um, these are by no means the only ones, but I encourage you to do your own research. And um, I would say if I see anything with EWG verified on it, I'm comfortable with that product. But the other tip is to just, you know, check the ingredients list and see if you recognize the ingredients. Um, I think in our next slide, we actually have a sample of a label um, that, that, um, 
it shows that. Yeah, so this is Vermont soap. Um, it's made in Vermont and it's very straightforward. It, you can see there's not a thing on there that probably everybody here hasn't already, doesn't know what it is. To me, that's also um, better than a third party certification. There you go, I know what's in it. There's nothing weird that's gonna cause a reproductive harm or wash into the water and harm wildlife or other people. So that's another trick is just look at the ingredients list and if you know what it is, um, there you go. Um, so here again is that list. And again, I believe we have it for you in your follow-up email. You'll get a recording of the webinar and you'll also get a copy of this list. Um, great thing to just have folded up in, in your purse or wallet or back pocket when you're, when you're out buying these things. Cleaning products. This is another tricky one, but the nice thing is most cleaning products that are chemical based can be replaced with um, non-toxic or making your own solutions. And even the really hard to clean things like ovens and stovetops and um, even sanitizing and disinfecting. Um, can You can do a lot of that with non-toxic products. You don't need bleach to clean. <laughs> that is something I would like to emphasize. Bleach is an asthmogen. It, it, it exacerbates and can cause asthma. Um, so the less you use of that, the better. And I know we've all been using a lot of it in the middle of a pandemic, um, but um, you actually need a lot less than you think you need to disinfect. Um, so you can find non-toxic cleaning products using these third party, again, we have third party um, uh, certifications. Um, some, you can look at the labels too, and you know, you can actually, we all have a little computer we carry in our pockets. You can look up ingredients you don't recognize. Remember those uh, signal words, danger, caution, warning. If you see those on your cleaning products, you have hazardous waste in your hands. Um, and I would recommend looking for something else. Those strong chemical smells are another sign, even that strong bleach smell. Um, and any, almost all chemical cleaners um, it says here most, but I think we're almost at all chemical cleaners should be treated as household hazardous waste if you are no longer using them and getting rid of them. And um, here's an example of a bleach label. Um, one of the problems with bleach is that it actually is just overused. I know people who have done like a 50-50 bleach water solution and, you know, it can make you very sick. Um, and this is, this is the kind of thing that's important to read before you use it. Bleach is a highly toxic substance. Um, you know, you need, it's actually telling you, you need to have gloves and eye protection when you use it. Has anybody here ever put on goggles before cleaning with bleach? Um, so just keep in mind that the labels have really important, good information on them. Um, and there are really appropriate ways to use bleach. We're going to talk about that in a minute as well. Um, Here's a close-up of, the, of the, 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 re, the things you need to know about using bleach, um, including um, the poison control center, the, in the eye irritant information, wear safety gloves and rubber glasses and rubber gloves, et cetera, adequate ventilation. That's another thing that happens is people will use it in a closed room and that can make you really, really sick. Next slide. Um, okay, so the third party certifications. This is again, just like the personal care product. These, uh, the, especially for cleaning products, the EWG Green Seal and, um, and Eco Logo, I'm not seeing the EPA one on here. There it is, Safer Choice. Safer Choice is um, the, probably the one you'll most commonly see on cleaning products. Um, most uh, grocery stores and places that sell green cleaning products have at least one brand that has one of these seals on it. So this is a good shortcut. Look for one of these seals. The, the two on the bottom um, are the personal care, the zero um, plastic and campaign for safe cosmetics. Those are more going to be on personal care products, but safer choice, eco logo, green seal, EWG, those are the ones that you might see on cleaners. So look hard at the bottle. They're not very big when they show up. They're like, you know, maybe a half inch across. So you have to look for them. Um, but if you're reading the label and paying attention to what you're buying, you'll see it. 
Um, the other thing you can do with uh, cleaner is you can make your own and they are effective. And um, you can just mix vinegar and water is a basic all purpose cleaner. Some people will add like a tablespoon of um, rubbing alcohol to that mix. We actually have a, a recipe that's gonna pop up in a minute. Um, hydrogen peroxide is a really good bleach replacement. Um, in fact, when we were teaching uh, this particular stuff to um, child care centers, um, they use a lot of bleach because they have to sterilize between kids on diaper changing tables and they have to have a certain dwell time, which means if they're using a disinfectant or a sterilizer, it has to sit for a certain period of time before you clean, wipe it off or it doesn't actually disinfect. Um, if you use a bleach solution, it only has a one minute dwell time, which we'll show you in a minute. Um, so vinegar, baking soda, and water are your basic ingredients for um, homemade cleaning. Lemon juice shows up in a lot of them as well. Um, Castile soap, you, you can use Dr. Bronner's, that's available widely, especially at like co-ops and those kind of places. Um, but you really only need a few basic ingredients to have all-purpose cleaners. And if you wanna sterilize something, use hydrogen peroxide. Um, Mike Vinegar also does a really good job on its own. And in fact, if you're cleaning your toilet, I just shake some baking soda in, um, pour in maybe a half a cup or a cup of white vinegar, and I let it sit for 10 minutes. Usually that will clean it on its own. Sometimes there's also a scrub, a little scrub after that, but some of it, it will just clean it on its own. Wait, can you go back to that first slide? I just wanna, um, the one right before that. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> Never mind. Um, I thought that was a different one. Okay, so all purpose cleaner. This is just a couple recipes. There's variations on this. Um, this calls for just a teaspoon of liquid soap, a squeeze of lemon juice, a splash of vinegar, um, and a quart of warm water. And I would say that one of the things I like about this recipe is the word squeeze, the word splash. I actually personally use a little bit more vinegar than that. I would put in like a a half a cup or a cup of vinegar, but um, some recipes call for a quarter cup. So that the, the concentration of vinegar to water is really your call. Um, and these other things, uh, the lemon juice and the soap, some people add a drop of essential oil if they want to scent. Um, scouring powder is just baking soda and vinegar. I've done that on my stove type top. I'll sprinkle the, um, sprinkle the baking soda on and spray it with vinegar and then just scrub it with a sponge and um, it really is effective. And you can use that same thing on a bathtub. Um, yeah, I think we, um, oh, so all that said, we understand that we are still in the middle of a pandemic. So um, if you want to use bleach um, to actually disinfect, there is a really good recipe on the CDC website. Um, soap and hot water are the most effective thing. Um, I'm sure it was all over, you know, everyone was talking about washing your hands for 20 seconds in the beginning. Um, what we know is that there's a fatty layer around the coronavirus molecules that soap and hot water just removes and renders it ineffective. So first step, just clean with soap and hot water. Um, if you want a disinfectant, the CDC has a recipe that is going to pop up in a second. Um, and it's just a small amount of bleach and, how, oh, we haven't gotten to that yet. So this is the CDC recommendations of just soap and water, just to be really clear. Um, and that's just, you could have a spray bottle with warm water and soap and you just spray these items. Um, we're not talking about a bleach cleaner. We're not talking about a hand sanitizer. We're just talking about soap and water. Um, and it's the act of cleaning and the little bit of soap that is gonna um, protect you from anything, any surfaces. We also know now that we, what we didn't know in March when we developed this is that um, from what we're hearing there, the last time I checked, there were no recorded cases of people getting the virus through touch. Um, that may have changed. So I'm not, I can't say that definitively and I'm certainly not an epidemiologist. Um, I'm just I'm telling you what I have heard from epidemiologists. Um, so, oh, somebody who looks like a doctor raised their hand. Maybe they have better information. Um, let's, we're gonna take a break and, and um, answer questions, but I wanna go on to the next slide. Um, and I think that's got the CDC bleach solution. Um, and the thing that's interesting about that is that the quantity 
of bleach to water is less than you think it might be. Uh, five table, tablespoons or a third cup of bleach per gallon of water. This is not a strong bleach solution in terms of smell, but it will disinfect um, or four teaspoons per quart of water. And the trick is to leave it on the surface for at least a minute. So you spray it on and you let it sit. That's called the dwell time. If, it, if you don't give it the dwell time, you're not disinfecting. Um, and that's the, that's the thing to keep in mind. Um, if you just spray it and wipe it, you're cleaning, but you're not disinfecting. You can do the same thing by just spraying straight alcohol. Um, so that, we just wanted to share that recipe from the CDC if you're looking for a disinfectant. And um, just to be clear, a disinfectant uh, will kill nine, I think it's 99% of the germs on surfaces, whereas cleaning will clean materials off of it, but doesn't necessarily kill germs. Um, okay, so we have a couple questions. Um, Theron, do you want to pop on and let's look at those questions? And we did see somebody raise their hand who had uh, a doctor that looked like they're a doctor. So I'd be curious to hear if they have better information than we do about, um, sure. about disinfecting. So that that covers um, all of the sections of our of our presentation. And we just have some resources up here, which we're going to share with you when we send out the presentation. So I think we can now move on to Q and A and um, and answer some questions and um, things like that. So the questions, um, let's see. We we have one that says um, another. It's it's more of a statement. It says another idea is non-GMO labeling or organic to avoid pesticides and herbicides. So. That's more of an idea and a statement. Um, and let's see, somebody did raise their hand. So uh, would you like to type in a, a comment or a question, whoever that was? Well, if they do, um, we can certainly answer it. I'd, also like just like to welcome every anybody and everybody to type in any questions or comments they have and we can respond to those and while we're waiting for that um we'll give it a couple minutes and if we don't have any more questions we'll close out and we will you will get the recording of this webinar in your follow-up email and some more resources um, and if you have a follow-up question or comment you can certainly email us directly also, and we're happy to hear from you. Mm -hmm. And as you can tell, we can't answer every question, but we could point you to some resources. And while we're waiting for people to type in questions, I'll just go through this list briefly and, and tell you what we're looking at here. CVSWMD is our website. We have a lot of information about safer cleaning, do-it-yourself recipes, and um, and reducing toxins, and we have information about our has waste collections. Um, Takebackday.dea, that is the, the nationwide take back, prescription take back program. And uh, below that is the epa.gov safer choice. That's the EPA certification for safer cleaning products. UL, um, they do a lot of uh, product review as well and and you can check out their website um, the ewg.org is the environmental working group and they have a lot of information about different products whether that's personal care products or cleaning products beat the micro bead is about microplastics and then if you want to learn a little bit more about our water systems how our municipal water works um, how it's filtered and treated you can go to the healthvermont.gov website and um, to that drinking water section. So that covers the resources that we have here and um, we can move on to any questions. Have any other questions come in, Cassandra? No, I think we're, I think the questions are over. All right. um, we really appreciate everyone's participation today um, and contact us directly if you have anything else you'd like to check in about or check out our on our website, cvswmd.org. We have a couple other webinars we're offering 
we have a recycling webinar and uh, all about uh, how to recycle right and we touch on things like electronics and hard to recycle materials in addition to regular recycling and we have a um, backyard compost webinar coming up on August 27th as well. Great. Thanks everybody for coming today and until next time. All right. Thank you. Bye.